Good evening, Michelle. God bless you. God knows what he's doing. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, we don't have anything. And when I say anything, I mean anything. Or put it another way, we don't have nothing to be worried about, to be anxious about, to be concerned about. We have nothing to be concerned. God's got everything in control. Everything is in his hand. Our only task and challenge is to keep our face in his word and, and seek to live out our lives by his word. Amen. And he knows we're not perfect. He, he knows we're going to, he knows we're going to miss the mark. He knows we're not perfect. <laughs> he even says that in his word. He said he, he, he knows that we are but flesh. <laughs> he knows that we're not going to cross all the T's and dot all the I's, but yet he loves us. And that is, What's so important? He loves us, no matter what we do. And I'm glad I've got a God, amen, that unconditionally loves me. And I'm not going to ever let the devil trick me into thinking because I mess up or have, have a fault or failure along the way that God no longer loves me or I'm no longer his child. I'm not going to let the devil ever do that. I'm not ignorant of the devil's devices. I know how that rascal works. And I'm going to keep my hand in the, in the winding chain. Okay, let's get going. Love to praise him. Love to talk about him. Love to share it with you all in talking about him. Good evening, Sue. Good evening, Brother Andre. Good to know we've got some faithful members who tune in for our Bible studies and hear what thus saith, thus saith the Lord. You pray for me this evening, amen, that God has a word for us as we continue to labor in the book of the Revelation. All right, you know where we are this evening. You know where we are. The, the, the outline is out there on Facebook. We try to follow it as much as possible. You know, we, we believe in letting the Holy Spirit have his way. And when we say that, we don't mean that he's going to do stupid and ignorant things. The Holy Spirit is very intelligent. But he has, he has the freedom. He has the reins, okay, of all of my messages and all of my teaching, preaching, to do what he wants. No matter how many notes I have, how many sermons I write, he knows he can change it anytime he gets ready, okay? So I try to follow the outline as much as possible. But if I deviate a little bit, you just know that's the Holy Spirit talking to somebody. Hey, Brother Sherman, God bless you, sir. Trust that you and Cora are doing well. Y'all pardon me uh, with my uh, cough drops and chewing gum. I do that to keep myself from coughing based on this uh, silent acid reflux that I continually deal with. But uh, in God's own time, he's going to take that away too. So I'm not worried about it. <laughs> All right. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Tonight should be interesting because this is a church that has our name, <laughs> at least a portion. Uh, we got a portion of the name of this church, okay? So maybe this will be interesting tonight in terms of what the Lord will say to us about this church, the Sardis Church, amen. Sardis Church, let me get my word around here so I can read it for us. Trust that you got your Bibles or iPads or whatever it is you read from, but we are reading, amen, the, we're going to read the King James Version this evening, all right, from Revelation chapter 3, starting at verse 1, 
And we will find these words. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write. These things says he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou hast that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are all ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Verse 5, he that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. The first six verses of Revelation chapter 3. Let's pray. Eternal God, our Father, we thank you for your holy word. We thank you for your holy presence, even tonight, as we peer into your word, Lord, that your uh, spirit will lead us and guide us and speak to our hearts and speak to our minds. You are our God. We are your children. We are your people. And we ask God that you would manifest yourself by speaking to us this evening. Lord, I ask that you would use me, use these lips of clay, use my mind, use, oh God, my mouth. Use me, oh God, for your service. Give me the anointing, anointing that's necessary, and I pray that you will anoint the ears of those who shall hear. Bless these who are on right now and those who may come hereafter. We pray that you might speak to them and they'll hear a word from you. You said, he that hath ears, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Hear us now in Jesus' name. We make this prayer. Amen and thank God. All right, brothers and sisters. Let me just give a brief brief summary of uh, <clears throat> what we're studying I'd like to keep us abreast of this that uh, first of all Revelation chapter 1 and verse 9 gives us a outline of the entire revelation that uh, the spirit gave to John uh, to record you remember what he said I was in the spirit on the Lord's day he said, and the Spirit began to speak to him and told him to write down the things that were being said. Well, in verse 9, it tells you, uh, it gives you rather an outline of the Revelation. Chapter 1 is about the things which have passed, okay? Revelation 2 through 3 gives you present. Uh, experience, experience, the experiences of the uh, revelation. Chapter 4 and to the remainder of that uh, uh, book, remainder of that letter is about the future. So you have the past, present, and future right there in verse 19. Okay, a revelation. Now, uh, we have to remember that because cause now we still, uh, we'll be getting to four, but right now we're still in the presence. 
And that's present. John is writing in the present in the sense that he's speaking to the church. This is the church age. This is the present age by which God is dealing with mankind. This is the church age. All right. Chapter one was the past. Now, I gave you three, uh, I had been giving you three different aspects of the churches as uh, uh, John recorded them. But then last week I began to give you a fourth category. And I want to give you those four categories again as it relates to these seven churches, okay? You have the historical context. Uh, historical context meaning that these, was, these were real Christian churches, real Christian fellowships that were uh, going on during John's time. These were seven different uh, churches, historically speaking. Not only that, but these seven churches are seven specific, amen, if you would, time periods of church history in the world. They reflect a time, uh, a, a cultural time uh, during the world's existence. It, okay? Every, well, right now, we're in the 21st century, of course, and a church, one of these churches represent the personality of this particular age in which we are living, okay? They, every one of them rep represents, amen, a particular time period, a chronological time period, okay, that uh, uh, goes on. Then thirdly, there is the... Uh, 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 the, 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 the condition of an individual's heart. In other words, the, the every, every character of each, every church, the character of each one of these churches are represented in the heart of every believer. Okay? Every one of these churches, the personality of every one of these churches is represented in the personality of every believer. For example, maybe you are a Christian who reflects the church at Ephesus. Uh, the church at Ephesus, remember, lost its first love. And the Lord was uh, upset at that church because it lost its first love. Maybe that's why you are. Maybe you are where the church at uh, Pergamos was or the church at Thyatira, Okay. Maybe, maybe you are a reflection of that. But each uh, uh, a Christian is a reflection of one of these uh, churches. And then, fourthly, uh, these seven churches represent uh, the uh, uh, reflects rather uh, the present day Christian church. Okay, present day Christian church. Now, here we are talking about. Sardis, the Sardis Church. I would just ask a, a, a question somewhat for you to ponder. Uh, and that is, do you think the church at Sardis <laughs> here in Asia Minor, uh, a church that John uh, literally addressed and talked to, is a reflection of the new Sardis Church, the church of which I serve as pastor, the church of which many of you are part of. Do you think that we might be a reflection of this church? Just a question for you to ponder and think about as we are going going through our study this evening. All right? Uh, we look at the uh, church here in Sardis. And the first thing he says about this church is that uh, I know your works. 
He said, I know you work. So that's the first thing he says is, I know your works. I wonder why he jumps right into it and start talking about their works. Evidently, this was something that Christ considered to be important, something that he needed to address. Why? Because this is, Sardis is a church that had a reputation, okay? It was a church that had a reputation that they were alive when in, when in fact they were dead. They were, the, the church at Sardis, now I got to try to keep my words together. I won't, don't want to say New Sardis because I say that often, but uh, I'm just talking about the church uh, Sardis tonight. It's Sardis in the book of Revelation. They had a reputation that they were alive when in reality they were dead. Amen? And so the condition of the church is the first thing we want to look at this evening. Is the condition of the church, which is represented by, first of all, the works, because that's what Jesus addressed. Now, that, there is a book. I uh, can't think of the author's name right now. That There's a book. I had it stayed on my desk for a while. People borrowed it. People read it. I think the last one that I gave to the read it, they didn't bring it back, so they still have it. Whoever you are, maybe you're still out there, and you hear me, you you got my, uh, my book. But uh, anyway, uh, there is a book that is written entitled The Autopsy, of a dead church, the autopsy of a dead church. Uh, the author is Lou uh, Mancari, Mancari, Lou Mancari. And uh, he writes this book entitled The Autopsy of a Dead Church. And he uh, references many times the church here at Sardis. Why? Because they had a reputation to be alive when really they were dead. Now, there's, there are several things that a, a coroner does when he's called in to confirm a dead body. There are several things that he looks at. Now, I want to talk about that because that's kind of in the textbook, okay? Uh, the Lou, Lou in the textbook addresses that. But we want to look at the condition of the church and what caused them to have the reputation that that they had. They had this reputation because of uh, uh, not so much what they were doing, but the motive with which they were doing it, okay? And I said that a few days ago in talking about uh, our motives, our motives for what we do are so important. Yeah, it was on um, uh, Valentine's Day Sunday message when we were looking at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, uh, verses 1 uh, through 13. But the verse, ver first verse 1, 2, and 3, it says, starts out by talking about though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, okay, and then it goes on to say, and though I have the uh, 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 gift of prophecy, though I have faith, uh, so to, so as to move mountains, he said. And then it says, though I give my body to be burned, in each instances of their works, he says, if I don't have love, it profit. <clears throat> Pardon me. It profits me nothing. So that's simply saying that if your motive is not right, it doesn't matter what you do. If your motive is not right in doing it, then it's of no essence to God, okay? Now, I mean, it's okay for man. You know, man can look at you and marvel and pat you on the back and 
give you plaques and write your name in books. All of that's good and fine when it comes to man, but when it comes to God, it doesn't mean anything, okay? None whatsoever. So your, it, it, it's important that we do work for the master, but it's more important that our motives be right when we do our works. So this was the first thing that uh, I think Jesus considered, I know he did, because he says, I know thy works, okay? So you can you can do these things, and you can fool mankind, but you're not fooling God. God knows the heart. Uh, First Samuel, First Samuel sixteen. First Samuel sixteen is what Jesus God says. Uh, man looks at the outer, uh, but God looks at the heart. God judges based on the status of the heart, not based on the outside. That's what man does. And so it's important that what we do, uh, when we do it, we do it with the right motives. You know, we don't do something just to have somebody say something good about us or have somebody pat us on the back. That's, that's, not, a, that's, that's not of any essence when it comes to God. Now, and if this this church right here, this church, the, its condition uh, had to do with its status in terms of its reputation. It had a reputation based on the fact that it was dead when, when or based on the fact that it was living from an external external standpoint, but internally it was a dead church. That was a condition. That, that reputation. They had a reputation that they were. Alive. And you see, you you. I, I, I preached a sermon been years ago about what the uh, community. What's what's your reputation in the community? What does people think about you? You know, and, and that's important. That truly is important. I, I, I never liked the idea about being a church in the community and the only time the church doors are open is on Sunday when the members drive in from the suburban area, come in, have service on Sunday, go back in the parking lot, never see cars in the parking lot till next Sunday. Now, that's not a church that has a reputation that is concerned about the community, Okay. And a church should be concerned about its reputation in the community. Now, you, obviously, you come in on Sunday and, and, and shout the uh, chandeliers down, you know. Yeah, you have a reputation that you're alive, but when it comes to doing the work that God tells us to do as a church, okay, with, with helping the hurts of humanity, we just as dead as a donor. And so that's important. That's important. And so Jesus looks at the condition, okay, <coughs> as do a, a, a coroner when he comes in to look at a body and, and, and declare it dead. He looks at it, you know, certain things he's going to do to pronounce whether it's dead or not. He's going to look at the activity. I, I I like to tell this story because it's really funny, but it's really it's not only funny, but it has a truth to it that I think is a reflection to a lot of, of different uh, of Christian fellowships. Okay, now back in the day, I I grew up in the, in the rural area as a little boy, and uh, you know we 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 used to have chickens around there every now and then, and. Uh, uh, every now and then, we would actually just go outside when we wanted the chicken. We didn't go to Heinen's or, or the grocery store. We went to uh, the local market, and you know we didn't go to the local market. We just go out there in, in, in the yard and uh, grab us a chicken, run him down, grab us a chicken, and uh, take and throw a number ten tub on it. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You can throw up a thumb or a heart or something. Y'all, most of y'all probably don't know what I'm talking about right here, but it's got to be somebody out there that 
knows where I'm going with this. And uh, we'd go out there and catch that chicken. And my stepfather would take that chicken by his by his legs and, 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 and lay him across the block and then take the act, get his neck where he wanted his neck to be. And uh, he would to take that axe and chop that chicken's head off, all right? Now, that chicken's dead just as sure as you're born when the head is chopped off. But as soon as he uh, releases that chicken, that chicken becomes so, that chicken be all over the place. Man, he'd be all over the community. He sometimes flip and flop and go down and get on other, other people's houses and he had to go dig him out, okay? But the chicken was just as dead as a doorknob. Now, I say that because I think some churches are like that. They are very active, but in actuality, they just as dead as a chicken with his head cut off, okay? Meaning that you got to, whatever you do, no matter how active you are, you've got to be active with the right spirit and under the auspices of the spirit. Now, here's what... Here's what's very important, because if you are doing things out of a carnal, from a carnal perspective, that is no essence to God. It must be of the spirit. It has to be of the spirit. Well, let me back up a little bit. I don't want to get too ahead of myself. But it, listen, a carnal church is a dead church. I don't care how active it is. doesn't matter what it's doing. But at the same time, too, a church that just jumps and shouts inside the building but never does anything on the outside of the building. Okay, you say, well, Tatum, we're not in a building now, so what are we supposed to do? Well, listen, who's really the church? Come on now. All y'all Bible, Bible scholars and theologians, who's really the church? The church is not the building. The church is the individual. And so the church as an individual, when you see there needs to be done, then you try to fulfill those needs. Amen? No, we can't set up in our ivory towers and act like because God is blessing us, nobody else has any other need. No, there are people right now that need uh, counseling. They need uh, food. They need clothing. They need all kinds of things. And we have to be about the Father's business. Amen? There's something that we can always be doing as an individual if we're open. Now, I say this about evangelism. I say this about evangelism. If, if, if you are, in fact, a tool that in God's hands to be used to take the gospel to other men, then that has to be your mindset. When you get up, uh, old folk, you say, when you get up a morning... <laughs> When you get up a morning, then you got to say, Lord, if there's somebody I need to share Christ with, please bring them into my presence. Please, and, and, and use me to tell them about Christ. Use me to tell me about their goodness, okay? you got to be conscious and thinking about these kinds of things. If you're conscious and thinking about them, the Holy Spirit will bring it into your consciousness of things you need to to do. Amen. I had a, uh, I made a phone call and I'm constantly on the phone now uh, in that we're in a lot. And when God puts somebody on my heart, I call them. I just, you know, I call them and put them because I don't think they're there by an accident. I think God puts people on our hearts, especially during this time for us to call. Them. Uh, uh, God put one of my friends, uh, childhood friends, been together, known each other since fifth grade, first grade rather. I'm sorry, went to, Vietnam, went to Vietnam, I mean the whole nine yards, just called each other every five, ten years. God put him on my heart, and I called him the other day. Man, that guy was so excited. He, he really was excited to hear from me. He needed to hear from me that day. People need to hear from us, just, just that we are thinking about them. That can make a person's whole day. Okay, so you got to be an instrument by which you're saying, God, if you need somebody, here I am, send me. Okay, let me get back. But this is about the works, and I'm going to talk about some more a little later on. This is about the works 
that uh, God expects us to do and expects them to expects us to do them a certain certain way. Amen. And if you like Paul said to the church at uh, First Corinthians chapter, uh, it's, it's the church at Corinth, and he records it in First uh, Corinthians chapter uh, three, verse one to. Uh, two, one and two. He said, I couldn't speak unto you as unto uh, spirituals. I couldn't speak unto you as unto mature Christians because you are yet carnal. You are carnal. You, 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 you think with the, with your flesh. You, you are, you, you're not in the spirit. You're not following the leading of the Holy Spirit. Okay. And so I couldn't talk to you like that. You, you not mature. You don't you you and even if I try to talk to you, you wouldn't understand what I'm saying because you're so far off of the mark. And so it is important that we seek to grow in the Lord so that when the Holy Spirit is speaking to us, we hear him. We know his voice. We know when he's talking to us. And so he says that uh okay. You need to you need to wake up. That's what he says. He says you need to wake up. In verse uh, verse two, he says, "Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are all ready to die, for I have uh, not found thy works perfect before God." Now that's a lot that he says in this verse right here. He says, uh, uh, "Strengthen the things that remain." So there are some things that's still alive in the church at Sardis, okay? It's not completely dead, all right? But it's dying. It's on its way out, he said. He said, and then he says, strengthen the things that remain, the things that's ready to die, the things that's still there holding on. You try to do the things to build them up and to keep them going. He said, for I have, I, he says, I have not found thy works perfect before God. Okay? Now, I see you got some works, but they're not completed work. They're not the kind of work that satisfies God. All right? And so that's part of the condition that's going on there in that church. In verses 2 and 3, we begin to see the cure of what he's talking about. Because he says, be watchful. That's what you're going to have to do. If you're going to have to overcome some of this deadness, you're going to have to wake up. You're going to have to be alert. you got to be about your P's and Q's and realize what's going on. Be watchful. Wake up. Be alert. Be on your toes, okay? you got to be watchful. you got to know that the Lord could come back any day now, okay? And, and old folks, you say, don't come back and let him catch you with your work undone. He said, be ye also ready, for in such a day as you think not, the Son of Man is going to show up. You don't know when he's coming, okay? He said, if the thief had known when, the, I mean, if the, if, the, if, the, if the man had known what hour the thief was going to break into his house, he would have been awake and ready for him, but he didn't know, okay? And so you got to be watchful. You don't know when a thief may break in, <laughs> But Jesus compared that, his coming with that, with a thief. He said, you got to watch. You got to watch. Any day now, he could show up. And I declare, brothers and sisters, it does look like the time is winding, winding up. The Lord is soon to come. So I'm saying, be ye ready. Just, just be ready. You don't know when he's coming. Don't let him catch you with sin in your heart. Don't let him catch you with unforgiveness in your heart. Don't let him catch you, Lord, uh, you know, stuff that you should have done. You put off and say, well, I'm going to do it tomorrow. Well, tomorrow may never get here, okay? For some people, it may never get here. So if he tells you to do something today, do it today. Don't put it off. Be watchful, okay? okay? He says, strengthen the things that... Uh, ready to die. Because he says, I found that uh, uh, that works is not perfect, meaning that they're not complete. You got something else to do. <laughs> they're not, they're not completed. All right. And so we see the, see the, uh, 
condition of the church. But we also see uh, the cure as he addresses that. And he says, remember, hold fast, cure. Remember, remember, remember what it used to be like. Lord, have mercy. You got to remember. You got to remember. Okay. Uh, remember, the, remember the real deal. Okay. Remember where you came from. Remember the bridge that crossed you, that brought you over. <laughs> remember, remember. I, I talked about the church a little bit on Sunday afternoon, uh, Sunday morning rather, and uh, talked about the special that was on PBS and uh, how the church has been instrumental and impactful in the lives of black folk for many, many years. Yes, and it is the church that has been our bridge. The church has been the means by which we have survived all the way back to the time prior to uh, uh, Emancipation Proclamation. The church was active. The church was involved. Not necessarily the building, but the believers uh, that would meet down by the river and sing songs and gather, call prayer. Good God Almighty! And would have prayer meetings and call on the name of the Lord. Oh, the church has evolved. The church, and it's still evolving. But listen, the church, the black church has been active in the black community. I thank God for the black church. I thank God for its preachers and for its mothers and for its deacons and for its trustees and for those who've been faithful down through the years, didn't always know the great theological truths, but they had wisdom. They had wisdom, and they knew how to survive. Good God Almighty, God gave them what they needed to get us across. And now we've gotten so smart today. We've gotten so intelligent and so educated today. We don't think we need the church anymore. But I'm here to tell you, brothers and sisters, according to the word, we need the church. We need the fellowship of one another. We need the fellowship of the saints of God. We need to pray for one another. Listen, things can get hard sometimes as individuals, as a part, and look at us as individual churches. Things can get difficult sometimes. Things can get so bad that we can't even uh, 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 call on the name of the Lord. We need to know somebody that in those days that know how to call up on the, call, call heaven up and tell him what I want because I ain't able to call him up. I need somebody else to call him up for me and tell him what I need and tell him what I want. Like those, um, Four men that brought that he a crippled man to Jesus, the man that had the palsy. The, yeah, he wasn't able to get to Jesus. But there were four men that knew how to get him to Jesus. They put him on a pallet and let him down through the roof. Listen to me, getting in a preaching tune. I can't help it, y'all. Y'all just got to pray for me. He couldn't do it himself, but there was somebody that knew how to get him to Jesus. In that time, brothers and sisters, in our lives when things can get so heavy and so hard that we can't do it ourselves. We need somebody else to do it. And that's what the church has been doing for years. The church has been helping the hurts of humanity. It has been helping us to get over. <laughs> As somebody say today, when I look back and I have to thank God for how I got over, the church has brought us over, y'all. Yes, it did. The church has brought us to where we are today. And because the church is not in the hearts and the lives of many of our children, they are acting like they don't need the church. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy on our young people today that's in the street killing each other like they're no more than some uh, animal or some ant or something. Have mercy on them. And I pray that God will... Somehow, through the prayers of the saints, turn this thing around. Lord, we need, to, we need to remember. We need to remember. That's what I'm talking about. We need to remember how I got over. <laughs> My soul looked back and wondered how I got over. Okay, he said, hold fast. Hold fast. Hold fast what you got. Then repent, he says. 
so, so those things that's still there won't die, okay? That's why we have to check ourselves. We have to check ourselves very often. We have to need to check ourselves. Check ourselves, okay? Don't check nobody else. The Bible says examine yourself. <laughs> Don't worry about examining nobody else. You ain't got to stand before God for nobody but yourself. You're going to have to be judged for yourself, okay? You're going to be judged according to the word. He said, and so you 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 examine yourself, and if anything that you repent of it, because you're going to stand before before God. If 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 we don't judge ourselves, according to First Corinthians chapter eleven, uh, he says God's going to judge us. <laughs> and y'all know that verse we referenced during communion, and he says if I have to judge you, there are going to be some sickly. And there are going to be some weak and some even going to sleep, die prematurely because of that. So we see the, the uh, condition, we see the cure, but we also see uh, the Christians in the church. He says, uh, he said, there's a few. <laughs> Let me go back to my, go back to my scripture. I, I want to talk about the few now, if I can, before I close out here, uh, because that's 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 quite important. He says, uh, uh, verse four, uh, thou hast a few names. Uh, this is in verse four. Even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Okay, there's gonna always be the faithful few. Are y'all listening to me tonight? There's going to always be the faithful few. There's a faithful few. I don't care what you do. There's always a faithful few, okay? There's going to always have the unfaithful few. Now, I'm thinking right now about uh, the faithful few that have been coming on the preaching and teaching broadcast since we've been going through this pandemic. I've been thinking about the faithful few that God has coming on, on Monday night and Wednesday and Sunday morning, been so faithful. You've been so faithful. And I tell you what, God's got the record. God's got the record. There's always going to be a faithful few, all right? And God's, God's going to reward you, okay? And he, and just like he says, you're faithful. That He said thou has a few names, even in a few names, uh, even in Sardis, which have not defiled themselves and have not walked, he says, uh, and have walked with, shall walk with, they shall walk with me, rather, uh, in white, for they are worthy, okay? And uh, that's important to recognize because there's going to always be uh, a faithful few, okay? And that faithful few are going to be the ones who's going to walk with the Lord in the end. They're going to be the one that's going to overcome because you're standing with God. God is going to stand with you. Amen? God is going to stand with you because you stand with him. But let me, before I, before I, before I close out, uh, reference again the autopsy of, 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 of a dead church and what a coroner does. And the first thing he does is he... Uh, he is to determine uh, uh, the cause of death or what's causing death or what the cause, well, they call him in after the thing is dead. <laughs> All right. And and, and, the, and and the church of Sardis was dead, okay, from all practical perspectives. But uh, Jesus knowing all that he knows, God knowing the heart, he knows the outside, the inside, and the, Every other side, he said, I still got a few in there that have not uh, bowed their knee to bail. There's still a few still there. And so, but uh, a, 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 a coroner determines the cause of death. And in this case, those that were dead or dying in Sardis was because of the type of work that they were doing and, and the work was doing. Okay. And, and it was like, uh, for example, they. They had a name that they were 
uh, doing works that were pleasing to God. Uh, for example, they were probably having choir rehearsal, and during the choir rehearsal, they were fussing and fighting like cats and dogs, okay? But then showing up on Sunday morning in their robe, singing like everything was hunky-dory. But God, God, God knew. <laughs> God knew. God knew what was going on. Amen. Folk in the pew didn't know. Folk in the pew didn't know they had been fighting like cats and dogs during choir rehearsal. Okay. But uh, the Lord knew. So he says, he says, I know your works. <laughs> That's what he says. I know your works. You got to remember these motives are going to have to be right, brothers and sisters. All right. But then the second thing that um, a coroner does in terms of a, a dead church is that uh, <clears throat> he reports, uh, he reports or reveals rather uh, the cause, the cause of death. What what caused the death? And we and we talked about that a little bit already. Okay. <clears throat> First of all. He he, he 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 determines the cause of death, uh, but then he uh, also um, re, re, uh, reveals. He reports to uh, the, uh, the authorities or whomever he has to report to. He reports to them uh, the cause of death, and then he reveals to them uh, the cause of death, and then thirdly. There's, there's another thing that the uh, coroner does when uh, he reports on death and things that are dying, all right? There's a third thing he does, and I made a note to it here somewhere. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, uh, uh. Oh, here it is, here it is, here it is, here it is, here it is. Um, the cause, the cause, the cause of death. Okay. He reports, he reveres, and the cause. He talks about the cause of death. Okay. Now, I'm, I'm closing when I tell you this this evening, that uh, he says... Hold fast what you have. Hold fast what you have. Hold fast. And I would say to those of you this evening that may be in dead situations, uh, situations that are looking dead, okay? Uh, for example, maybe you in a dead marriage, Okay? Or a marriage that's dying, in a relationship that's dying, I would say to you, hold on, okay? Just, 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 just hold on to the Lord's unchanging hand. Hold on, <clears throat> okay? Because God knows where you are, and He knows what you've been dealing with. And he knows what you're dealing with right now. He he knows. He he. I mean, he, he's not somewhere sitting off somewhere twiddling his thumbs, um, divorced from what's going on with you as his child. He knows all about what's happening with you. Matter of fact, the scripture says it like this: We have not a high priest that cannot be touched by the feeling of our infirmity. In other words. He says, when we are touched by something, God himself is touched. And if God is touched, he knows what's going on. And so if you're in a dead, dying situation, just hold on, okay? It can be death all around you, but just you hold on. Don't, don't let that affect what is, is going to happen to you. Because remember, the character of Christ reveals the fact that one day we're going to go before him. And when we go before him, we're going to hear him either say, depart from me, or we're going to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Servant, I don't know what you want to hear, 
but I want to hear him say, well done. And I'm trying to hold on in the midst of a world that seemed to have turned its back on God, okay, in, in the midst of a world where Christians who used to say they were love God, used to say they loved God, they were on fire for God, now they seem to have no uh, affection, no uh, influence, no uh, anything that will reveal that they have a relationship with God or no God. But don't be influenced by that. You got to know for yourself. You got to know that you know you know that God is real, okay? You got to know that. And you got to hold on to that, amen, with everything that's within you. You hold on to the truth of God. You, you hold on to it, amen. You hold on to the truth that Jesus is is the savior of man. You hold on to the fact that he is the way, he's the truth, and the life. When folk call you everything but a child of God, you hold on to God's unchanging hand. When they act like, you know, you anything, you are any, uh, less than a man, a human, by the way they treat you, you hold on to God's unchanging hand. And I know, I know it's going to be all right. All right. I know it's going to be all right. 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 And so we, we look at the condition of the church and we look at Christians in the church. Okay. Sometimes it tells it, it turns us off, and we don't want to go back up there. We don't want to be a part of this group or this organization. Don't you do it. Don't you do it. You hold on. You hold on. Don't you let them turn you away, okay? Don't Like I said yesterday about the ark, sometimes it gets pretty stinking in the ark. <laughs> but you stay in the ark because if you get out, you're going to drown, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you only have two choices, to stay in here and smell the stench or to get out and drown. So I'm going to stay in here. I'm going to wait until the Lord comes back again. Anybody else going to wait? Anybody else going to wait on the Lord? Wait on him. <laughs> he said if we wait on the Lord, we will mount up with wings as an eagle. And then he said, said we we'll run, not be weary. And we will walk, and we are not not faint. Faint. I'm about to get me another timekeeper. <laughs> All right. As he said, my time is up. I got to go. <laughs> All right. But let's hold on to God's unchanging hand. Come hell or high water, I'm gonna hold on. <laughs> Old folk, you say I may be blind, but I'm gonna hold on. <laughs> I may be crippled, but I'm going to hold on. <laughs> you may call me everything but a child of God, but I'm going to hold on to God's unchanging hand. God's got a way, y'all, and it's mighty sweet. Why? Because you can lay all your burdens right down at his feet. He knows the road, and he can carry your load. God's got a way. And it's mighty sweet. God's got a way of backing up. He can back up with your blessings. <laughs> yeah, he can. He can back up with your blessings. You hold on to his hand. All right. All right, I guess that's enough for tonight. All right. You hold on, though. I want you to hold on. When they lie on you, you hold on. Hey, Sister Prater, you hold on. In the midst of your trials and your tribulation, you hold on. You hold on. Hell hounds on your trail. You hold on. You hold on in the troubles and your trials. Just hold on. Keep keep your hand in the winding chain. All right. Whatever you do, don't 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 give up on God. 
because God is not going to give up on you. Amen. You be the you be one of the few in that dying church. <laughs> yeah, you be one of the few in the Sardis church that's going to hold on even though they're dying all around you. Okay. All right. Uh, doors of the church are open. If there's a one that never accepted Christ tonight but would like to do so, there'll be, a, there'll be a document on the screen immediately following this little sermon. You can get in touch, follow the prompts of that document, get in touch. Some will be on the other line. They'll have a conversation with you. If you want to be a part of the New Sardis Fellowship, you can uh, also follow the same procedure. Amen. Amen. Want to renew your covenant? You just signed on and heard the New Sardis uh, preacher and seen some of the New Sardis family. You want to renew your covenant with the New Sardis family? You go ahead and follow the prompts on that document. And somebody will be there to meet and greet you and give you direction from where you should go from there. All right? Okay. The night was Revelation chapter 3, the church at Sardis. The church that uh, had a reputation that she was alive when, in fact, she was dead. All right? But at the end, he said, I got a few of you. <laughs> I got a few names that hadn't bowed. So I hope you all be in that few come the end of the church age and that you will be called up to meet the Lord in the air. All right, we're back and out of here. God bless you. Have a good evening. Uh, I remember a song today I was singing most of the day. Hey, TK, I remember a song uh, that we sung whenever we concluded the sermon, the service on Sunday, and, and we'd always sing, God has spoken. So let the church say amen. All right, somebody else want to sing that with me tonight? Just a little bit where we are. Let the church, <laughs> my voice is gone, say amen. <laughs> let the church say amen. God has spoken. So let the church Say amen. One more time. Let the church say amen. Let the church say amen. God has spoken. So let the church say amen. Praying for you. Praying for every one of you. As soon as I go off, I'm going to say a special prayer for every one of you. God bless you, Carrie. God bless you. I think I've, 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 I've spoken to most of you. Sister Pat, amen. I think I spoke to most of you on the night. Sister uh, uh, Ethel and she, she, I think I spoke to most of you that's on the night. Amen. If I haven't spoken to you, Sister Gladys, you send your name up on the screen right quick, and I'll holler at you. Uh, Camille, Camille, God bless you, Camille. Amen, Francine. Amen. I, Michelle, I, Naomi, God bless you. Hey, I see see all them prayers, and I don't know what them little brown things are up there. <laughs> but listen, I'm going to pray for you as soon as we go off. Uh, matter of fact, why don't I pray for you before we go off? And why don't I just do that right now? And then we'll close with prayer tonight. Love you. And like Sister Mamie Knight used to say, love you and pray for you. <laughs> Father, in the name of Jesus, we do thank you for this opportunity to have uh, presented your word tonight, Lord. We hope with some measure, some degree of clarity, and that they understand, God, what you what you had John to say to the church at Sardis, Lord. And maybe may it be applicable to their lives in some way. We ask that you would bless each and every person. Bless them individually. Bless their families, Lord. Bless their family members, oh God. You know who they are and you know where they are. You hear this preacher tonight. You hear me praying for them. Asking your blessings will be upon them. Bless them as they go out. 
Bless them as they come in, as few as it may be, but you still bless, O oh God, in Jesus' name. Watch over their homes, Lord. May your God and angels be by their sides, even as they sleep and slumber during the night. Keep them in the hall of your hand and help us all to be ready. No matter when you call our names, help us to be ready to hear your voice. And may we hear your voice. Say, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. Come on up. Now we're going to make you ruler over many things. Enter now into the joys of the Lord. This is our prayer as we close out tonight. And we ask it in Jesus' name. And for his sake, we humbly pray. Amen and good night.